Hello everyone. Uh, there's, I've got a question for you. So I'm going to do this sort of talk, which is telling you a story about uh, Project Nimbus, which is the journey that we went on to project moving images onto clouds. And what are the kind of current thoughts are is to try and use this talk to turn it into a bit of a vehicle to kind of present to kind of people from civic leaders like the uh, councillors to different businesses about the value of risk. And so I'd be really great for any kind of feedback. We might have time for questions at the end or not, depending on how quickly I kind of rant through everything. Uh, but yeah, so this is a kind of, uh, to see what you think really. So I kind of identify as an artist and lots of different things. And I think one of the things that really drives me is this idea of our relationship to kind of technology and how that's so rapidly kind of changing that we can't really kind of keep track of everything. So there's, I'm really interested in that and this idea of community and kind of bringing people together to kind of see what, where we can go with cross-disciplinary collaboration. But I'll get, I'll get straight in. Uh, That works really well if it's really loud, but it doesn't have the same impact if it's not. Uh, I generally like to do things that involve a lot of risk and kind of make things up on the spot a lot like I'm kind of doing now. I'm quite terrified. It's kind of a lot easier hanging out of a plane a mile above the ground staring at the floor than it is uh, stood up here right now. So if I kind of run around and kind of get a bit excited and lost, just bear with me. I'll, I'll come back around. So, Clouds, uh, man-made cloud projections. Uh, the earliest that I've found is from the book 2829, written by Jules Verne's son, Michael Verne. And in this book, he depicts uh, a kind of superpower kind of newspaper called the Earth Chronicle. And they project uh, on the clouds during the day and kind of cover the entire sort of planet. And they have all of these dark intentions about doing all of these uh, different things to kind of take away the sun so they can constantly kind of project advertising. So that's one of the earliest things that I found, which is potentially one of the dangerous things about the potential of this technology. Next is Harry Grindel Matthews. So around the 1930s, this guy also invented the death ray. He's uh, one of my heroes. And he projected uh, time on the clouds as well as lots of other different things. He also projected an angel, apparently, uh, around kind of Christmas time, which it's quite funny how a lot of people have this obsession with angels and clouds. She'll see. Deborah Kelly, Boy of the Gods. So this is kind of early 2000s. So you, she used the same kind of tech as uh, Harry Grindel Matthews, which is like this huge kind of like cannon with a big sort of truck light in and a couple of lenses. And this is projected in Sydney, as you can tell. And, uh, but it's only happened a couple of times. And one of the things about this kind of medium is that it's, it's really difficult, really, to find the clouds in the right place at the right time at the right height, which is probably why not much of it kind of really kind of happens. Also, various other big things which we'll get into. Uh, there's also Hey Hey. So they did a project using a laser. So they used a scan laser, which is different to the one that we made. The thing about a scan laser is that it's, it's moving really quickly, and so you've still got the same intensity of beam, which will be uh, important later on. But there's the project that they did, they projected onto this incinerator and then went engaged with the local community and told people at the community that if you'd start turning all your lights off, then this green cloud, which is above the sky, will get smaller because you're using electricity. Probably one of the best projects I've seen using clouds. And of course we all know how to get Batman. Can we turn the lights off, actually? Is that possible? Somehow? So my journey started when I was doing my MA back in 2007 and I was looking at uh, non-lethal weapons of mass communication and I came across this paper from 1981 by the US military detailing weapons uh, from the Vietnam War called Non-Lethal Weapons Terms and References. And this is a huge kind of like booklet and it's got some amazing weapons in about sound weapons and all of these things. 
And it was the one in the middle that really got me, which is Hologram Prophet, which is a projection of this ancient god over a small little village, so they think it's rapture, the end of the world. And, uh, and you go in and take them over. And I also like this one as well. I remember non-lethal, but he kind of died. So when I came across this, I was sort of really concerned about, well, a couple of things really is that, one, I suppose that, that's possible, and two, that there's going to be this kind of seduction by this process into advertising. So I wanted to sort of start off on a journey to make something that was kind of open source to put in the hands of kind of artists and activists and anyone really, that if this happened, there'd be a way that we could subvert this. My original idea was an angel, which uh, just kind of, I don't know why, but there's, there was something about this. I wanted to project a symbol of hope, that's why it was. And then the more I thought about this, like the power of this image is that this could either be a symbol of hope or it could be an angel of death. So depending on how this image is kind of read, this can have the exact opposite effect of what I'm sort of trying to do. And then I start to think more about how that could work in terms of like these non-lethal weapons or weapons of mass communication, about how you preload the internet with all of these stories about this angel of death or hope is going to appear that would then define what's going to happen and how the public are going to react to it. So around this time I was uh, on Instructables and I got sent this in my little inbox. Instructables is a website which I'm sure most of you know which uh, sends little projects by other kind of uh, makers and things and he made a laser uh, image projector, a still image projector. Now the reason why a laser is so important, and especially for the clouds, is that it's a uh, single, it's a point source, so it's always in focus because it's a single frequency of light. So that's why in lasers in clubs it kind of cuts all the way through because it doesn't have a focal plane. So I thought the best way to kind of do this would be to kind of make one of these things and stick it on a 16mm projector. Now I love 16mm projectors and I couldn't bear to take it apart, so I kind of made this whole construction on top and uh, I projected it with a little laser. So this laser here is out of a CD burner. It goes through this tiny little lens out of a point and shoot camera uh, and then goes through another lens and that focuses it. And you turn on the projector and it kind of whirs around. Now, it didn't work. Now the reason it didn't work is actually not my fault, it turns out. But it took me five years to work that out. Uh, the... Oh, totally lost my thread. That's weird. Uh, the other thing as well about this is that it's like it's a massive Hefty device. 60mm projectors are a massive ball lake anyway to kind of make them work because of how uh, kind of complex they are to kind of thread. And so for me to kind of take this up into a helicopter was just a general no-no. Because it didn't work, I kind of left it alone. Uh, it's a little bit about me kind of in the meantime to kind of explain sort of part of the journey is that I quite like to do stuff. So uh, one of my friends told me ages ago is that we all grew up in public. And so one of the things I like to do is just go out there and just sort of do things and then just see what kind of happens from it. But I find that to be a real great way to kind of explore things. I also do quite a lot of uh, commercial work, which I use that as a way to fund my practice. So uh, I kind of go off and make kind of videos and all these th different things for these people and tell them about my research. That pays for my kind of artistic research. A lot of these people are really into the idea that rather than funding a kind of couch at some kind of production company, they're funding someone for genuine kind of exploration or for something to do with art or collaboration. Now, the catalyst for this, so at Fon Festival in 2011, we'd just finished doing a pirate radio station from a six foot swan pedalo with John O'Shea, and we're on his way back, and we're just chatting around about ideas, and I was telling John about this, this cloud idea, and he was like, well, why don't you do it? It never really occurred to me that it was possible to sort of do. And then this was, he introduced me to two people at that sort of time. One was uh, Abandoned Normal Devices Festival, which is a kind of new cinema and cultural uh, festival based in Manchester. Uh, we'd just been working with the Octopus Collective. But he also introduced me to a pilot who flew 747s. Now, the 747s, uh, I had a chat to this guy and he was telling me about all these little local airfields that are just full of pilots. They'd be happy to modify the plane and take up anything and you can just glue it to the wing or something like that. And so that made it all seem possible. So I uh, got a tiny little bit of seed money and we just used this for the start of the exploration. Now, a key point about this is that we're in this caravan for a week in the middle of Manchester, just talking to God knows uh, whoever kind of came in the door, which is a really interesting process in itself. Uh, and I met Liz Elts from New Scientist. So 
there's that will come back in later, but I think it's just worth mentioning at this point that that's where we kind of started the kind of conversation. It wasn't until four years later that we actually finished the conversation. Around this time, I've been doing lots of projections out of moving vehicles. So this is a projection out of a, a camper van of Edwin Mavage's horse in motion, which I've reanimated it. This projection is onto railings, which is why it looks invisible. And throughout kind of this exploration of being uh, projecting out of vehicles, it's uh, maybe got me interested in this idea of planes, and maybe rather than it being a helicopter, it could be something that could be in motion. Now, at this point, the horse was only a, a viewpoint and a, a kind of direction indicator to the zoo praxiscope, which is what Mybridge's device was that he originally made to show the horse, arguably the first ever photographic projector in the world, which has a disc of 14 images. And uh, then you've got a shutter and a hand crank. And he turns the wheel, and you get a flash across uh, the image as one wheel goes one way and one wheel goes the other way and then you put those flashes of images together and you get motion. But the thing about this is that we could potentially make this lightweight. So my version, the first place, was a Viewmaster disc, a scale electric controller for variable resistor, speed control. The repurposed bits of the laser, so we've still got the red laser there that goes through this disc, and the lens to kind of correct it. And I was thinking that we could kind of shoulder mount this thing and sit in a plane and kind of fire it out the side. Uh, and Another thing that happened around this time is that lasers are completely changed in value. So these lasers come out of a tiny little hybrid projector, which actually happens is this projector. So inside this projector, there's nine of these blue lasers, which are two watt. And this was like $35. So this was the kind of, so the more power, the better, the brighter it's going to be. That's what, that's what I naively thought at that time. I went to see Aaron at Umlaut, which I suppose most of you all know. And Aaron completely changed my way of thinking about things. So I went to see him about making the shutter, because that was the one thing that I couldn't make out of the, the bits of random stuff I had on my workshop floor. And his kind of approach to it was like, let's remake everything, and let's laser cut everything, and then we can do different generations of things and take the journey from there. So we used <coughs> the Viewmaster disc as the, the kind of the benchmark for everything, and then we, we came up with an initial prototype. So the first prototype was, uh, all laser cut, we've got an image disc at the back with 16 mil filming. We've got this other slit here. I've got two independent motors which you can control the speed of. I mean, it can't really be that hard to figure out how this, the first projector works. It's just two discs. And so I spent ages of time. I got in touch with my old 16 mil friends and we spent ages trying to figure it out. And we couldn't get it. We couldn't get anywhere with it. I started to experiment with the laser that we've got. And this laser just uh, with this long throw lens to see if we could potentially do it from the ground. And it was this image in the top left hand corner that really kind of drew my attention because at that point it comes back to a focal point. And when it comes to a focal point it's just as intense as being a single beam. Now before I take this up into a plane or point it at the sky I need to know that I've done absolutely everything I can uh, to make sure that I'm not going to do any damage. There's a woman called Grace Hopper who's got this amazing quote that it's better to ask forgiveness than get permission, which I find with a lot of the work that I do, no one will give you permission for. And there's no laws for or against it, so it's best just not to ask. But the only way you can truly sort of embody that, I think, is to do absolutely everything you can to make sure you can stand up in a court of law and, uh, well, just say you did everything, I guess. So I went to see some uh, physicists. Uh, so this is Ben Whitaker, and there was also Mike Nix. And we've been working on a project called Phase Revival, which uses a, uh, a series of pendulums to explore uh, femtosecond spectroscopy. And it turns out that femtosecond spectroscopy, which is their scientific practice, was partly inspired by Mybridge. So Ahmed Zaville uh, used Mybridge as an analogy on his Nobel Prize winning paper to kind of explore uh, what they do. And essentially what they do at a femtosecond, which is a million billionth of a second, they uh, look at atoms using a very similar principle to how Mybridge photographed the horse, which is a series of trip wires. So Mybridge captured time a thousandth of a second and was one of the first to do that, which led to the horse's hooves leaving the ground at the time, which was a popular debated question. And there was something about these scientists that were just really interested in this idea that we just wanted to figure out how this whole process worked. 
And their interest was that basically they got this device to kind of push me out of the way and just start to take it apart and kind of break it, which was, you know, which was really exciting to see this kind of engagement. Uh, so, even with these two physicists working on it, we still couldn't figure it out. It was sort of uh, ridiculously, the answer is ridiculously simple, which we'll, we'll get to in a bit, but it was, it took us, I think there was too many parameters of what we could kind of control. So, and this became, this was the end of the residency with the Anne Festival. Uh, and this is kind of where the work kind of got to. And this, uh, okay, so part of this, part of this project, because I've got this kind of commercial practice, and one of the things that's quite interesting about it is that this is kind of research. So all of the money that's kind of been paying for this has been coming from kind of investing sort of time and paying for other people's time. And at this point, the, one of the things that kind of held everything together was the fact that there was no image. So all of the different people that have been speaking to, including new scientists, it was never about projecting a specific image on the clouds. So one of the things we spoke to new scientists was about is that what image uh, do they want to project which will engage their scientific community? And with the scientists, it was the same thing. What is important to them about what the potential of the image is? And the same thing with the pilots. And I think starting the kind of the project without knowing where it's going to go was something that uh, really helped with the progression. During this time, shortly after, I met uh, Vlad Strukov, who's a cultural specialist. And he was really excited about this idea of the image, and we explored this idea of a still image. And the work that I did with him, a lot of that basically went on trying to find a plane and all of these other little bits of things. And so, so this is really weird. I'm, I'm kind of condensing the talk, and there's a couple of slides kind of missing. Uh, so at this point, we had this little plane. And we've been to an aircraft, uh, an air an airport just outside of uh, Selby in Yorkshire. And there was two options. So there was this little plane here and then this plane. So this one's sort of like 360 kind of horsepower, goes really fast, looks like a kind of spitfire. This one's like a kind of little mini. It's really safe. It's nice. can fly at night. This one can't fly at night, but this one can. It's a lot cheaper. It's about 50p a minute. This one's about a pound a minute. Makes no logical sense. But of course, we went for this one. <laughs> now, at this point, I've not even thought if I like flying. I'm sort of sat in the back of this thing, the little GoPro, thinking, what am I doing? I've, I'm doing it with the window open because I'm going to imagine holding this kind of projector. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably about as scared as I am now, actually. It's interesting. And so, there's something nice about this part of the process, about just throwing yourself to the point and not getting caught up too much about it. When I went to see the pilot, I had to visit him three times before he even let me in the plane, because you don't have any small problems in aeroplanes. You've either got a problem or you've not. So, so this is me holding onto the side, because that'll stop me falling out <laughs> if we go upside down. And it's an amazing experience. And at this point, everything completely changes for me. It's, uh, I actually like flying. It's really good. But there was no way it was going to work from this aircraft because it was, we couldn't fly at night. There was uh, you're kind of going way too fast. You stick something out of the side of the plane and it kind of goes like that. Uh, so we got to the end of Leeds Creative Labs working with Vlad Strukov and one of the people on there called Simon Popple knew uh, someone who'd worked on a Zoopraxiscope replica, it's one of the seven in the world. And I said, would you like to contact him? He's like, yeah, of course. So we gave him a call and he explained the ratio of one to minus one. So as one of the disks goes one way, the other disk goes the other way and it's as simple as, simple as that, which baffled us for, for months and months. So straight back to Umlaut. Uh, Aaron loves a challenge, and so uh, he used Lego gears as a way to kind of uh, work out how to do it, and we had the Zoo Praxiscope Mark III, although I think it's probably the Mark II. Uh, straight back to 60mm, so we uh, shot lots of 60mm frames of the horse, because we thought 
if we're going to do this, it'd be really nice to see the horse as the first thing, following the footsteps of Mybridge and see what he saw. And this is the first time of his testing it. Yes, you're not supposed to be able to see anything. It does work, and we could see it, but there's no way it's going to work on a cloud. And so, one of the key things about this is the laser. I'll let you work this properly. That's awesome. I can see the legs going, that's brilliant. Yay! Oh, that's a pretty cool moment. Yeah, that is a pretty cool moment. I'm all about that. <laughs> yeah. Now can we do it with the proper laser? So their proper laser is a 5 watt uh, laser, it costs £20,000, it's got a cooler about this big. Uh, it, ha it takes ages to kind of warm up and we could see it quite clearly but not that clearly, you could just about see it with the naked eye, it picks up quite well with the film but there was no way we were going to be able to take this up onto a plane. So game over really, it's like there was no way that this process was ever going to work. And that was it, it was the end of the line. And then I got a phone call from Mike the next day. And this is what he said. So that's the image, that's just a glass plate that I've written test on. So that's just a test image. Uh, that's nothing special, that's a perfect to film. This is the cylindrical lens which is equivalent to the slit. So this will also move from left to right. So the motion for the oops, the motion for the thing is going to be that sort of motion. So that's effectively the slip wheel and that's the image one. It's just a single frame and it demonstrates the principle. Yes. Um, so the beam comes through here. The beam is complemented at this point, expanded by this lens as before, and then focused to a strike by this cylindrical lens. So the strike occurs here on the uh, slide, and then that's the fixed cylindrical lens that recall makes it and projects it onto the screen, which is the box at the moment. So if I just take that out of the way for a second, then I can just make sure it's aligned. So, laser on, and you can see on the box, if I just project the light straight through the slide, I get a test. You got that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's not very interesting. If I put the Oops, it's falling apart now. It's guaranteed. If I put the lens in there, then you can see that what we end up with is a very, very thin stripe here. So that's a privilege to the slit. But it's got the full optical power of the laser going through it. And then you've got a beam which is expanded slightly when it hits this collimated lens. And it's about the same width there as it is on this lens. So it's traveling collimated from the lens to the screen, which is important because then the screen can be as far away as you like. So, We'll just push the box out of the way, we can stick it up on the wall. Is it a test on the screen? Yeah, so it's like this down. So what you notice with the test on the screen there is that it's the same size as if I remove the cylindrical lens completely. So Mike had this idea. Now, the only kind of downside to this idea is that to test out this theory is going to cost a £1,000 on lenses which nobody seems to have lying around, well, at least for me. And this coincided with uh, a residency from the Octopus Collective who got in touch that same week to say, oh, we'd like to see if you could do a bit more work on, the, on Project Nimbus. We have about £1,000, which was great. It's like straight in, straight out. Didn't even think about it. And then yes. Yes. a couple of weeks later, yes. we had the first time that we saw it. Now, the horse is running oh, vertical, which is why it's not very great. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh my god, that's amazing. So this is the point where I think the actual horse kind of took over the point that that should be the first image because it was the point of where the horse kind of brought the two kind of disciplines together along with the discipline of the maker. So another thing during this time is that we uh, started to kind of explore with the two scientists I've been working with uh, and 
uh, Andrew Wilson and Lawrence Malloy, this idea of kind of collaboration. So we started this collective called Superposition, which has done various other things, which I'll come back to sort of slightly later on. We did a presentation at the Fun Festival uh, with Vlad, which was uh, a really interesting way. And like one of the things about this, why I left the slide in, is that we used to do the whole presentation just on uh, completely analog, which is a really interesting way to do it because it's not like you do digital where you can just have a quick flick through your slides to see what the order is. You've literally got to make up uh, as you go along. We went back to the plane, we sort of tested it out with the small little laser. We didn't think it was bright enough. It was going to cost us about 200 pounds of time to go up, so took out a loan, we invested in a kind of new laser, which was two and a half watts. Went straight back to Umlau to try and build all of these uh, things into one thing. And this happened over quite a quick succession of time, but it's actually been over sort of three years. And the, the role of the maker in this was kind of completely critical because it, there, was, there was art and science on one side, but the role of the maker uh, informed us as much as we informed it in, in terms of disciplines and things because it was right there from the core and a driving force. So we went back up into the plane. And nothing. <laughs> so this is all we got. But one thing we noticed about this is that you might as well be projecting on a hedge. You can't even see that it's a cloud. So you can't even see there's an image. Uh, so there's one key thing about this is that it, it reduced our window to about 15 minutes. So we needed to be able to see the horse where we've got some clouds in the background so you can actually see context. The other thing that we changed as well, because we're using 16 mil film, now 16 mil film kind of loves laser light and it just melts away. So we made a laser disc, uh, which then kind of turned it into like high definition. It was super clear, it was really nice. It also made it a lot easier to kind of share the design, because now everything uh, was in there that we could kind of share. Now it became quite abstracted from where we started off originally, because we wanted to do something that was really low cost. And now we spent like a grand on lasers and a grand on uh, lenses which kind of takes it out but there's still the kind of the core thing of being able to you know build the zoo praxiscope for free just with the normal process with the actual slits and then nothing a whole year absolutely nothing we lost the plane the pilot the airfield we landed at night they set up a load of cars on the runway they didn't like that they banned us and so we just thought again it was just kind of game over a brick wall we had this amazing projector, uh, all kind of ready and working, and uh, people seem to be a little bit scared of it now because it's, you know, taking la lasers and planes don't really go well together, especially with all the stuff in the media. And so here we can see the laser light coming through, which goes through uh, a lens here, which then diverges the beam to this uh, <coughs> lens disc here, which then turns it into a uh, a line, just like Mike was saying, that goes through the image disc and then there's another lens here which corrects the image. So as the image disc goes one way with the horse, the line goes the other way in sync. So that's when we get these flashes of images. Uh, we applied for some money to kind of look back at the project and kind of reflect on the process, which was just another way of getting some money for some plane fuel really, spending all the fee on that. And out of the blue we got under the plane. And there's, it just came out of nowhere with the pilot. Now, what was really interesting about this process is that the pilot had also been taken on the role of a maker. So maker turned into something that was more about someone who had expertise, who was sharing the project, who wanted the kind of the project to work. We'd not, we'd offered to pay everyone, but because we weren't doing it, we were driven by advertising and we were just driven to see if it could work. They were really interested in the same thing that we were. So it became this kind of collective pursuit of discovery. And, but the thing with this airport is that it was just down in Nottingham and we're nowhere near it. Uh, so we had to get good at reading clouds and we looked at all the different things and one of the key people, uh, key disciplines who don't like clouds are astronomers. So when it's bad for astronomers, it's good for us. And there's, uh, this is the place that we used to read the Red Earth called Ogimet. And we were looking for clouds like this at 5,000 feet, that's uh, 10,000 feet there. And this is not easy not easy to get, uh, especially when you've got the pilot to get in the right place, you've got to get uh, either the scientist or someone else to kind of come and film. There's so many different things that have all got to come together at the same, at the same time. 
But then, in July, no, in June 2015, uh, we finally made it up. Everything kind of came together, and we got the first images. So one of the issues we had with this is trying to capture this on film is completely different because the horse's frame rate is some kind of ridiculous weird 0.8625 number and trying to get that on film means that you don't really, out of this, out of a seven minute film, there's three f frames which are actually of a full horse, everything else is just a tiny little section of the horse so it's, it's really interesting this relationship between how it looks uh, when you're up there and also how it, how it sort of captures on film. So, so after this, there's, uh, the article kind of went out on the, the new scientists that we've been chatting to all of this sort of time and kind of kept them engaged with the process. And we were really keen that the, it didn't become about this spectacle and it became about the whole point of collaboration between all the disciplines. And uh, when we first spoke to new scientists, we sort of pretended that uh, Wired were interested for a world exclusive and that made them really fight for it. And then, uh, but we, so they'd fight for it. And we said that the only way that we'll give it you is that if we get to co-write it with you. And then so we had this really nice process of being able to sort of send them this after four years and then write this piece together in there, which was, you know, a really interesting process to then sort of see how it kind of expanded out into the world. Uh, I'll just finish with a video, actually, of uh, one of the fans of the project, let's say. So just let me... Uh, so, yeah, that's a nano audience okay, for that. Uh, so, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>